Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the main character types that Søren Kierkegaard talks about in Fear and Trembling, bringing it up in the section that he calls the preliminary expectoration, is what he terms the knight of faith. Knight in a chivalric sense, but as I've pointed out elsewhere, let's not take this as a solely male thing because it's equally possible for anybody of whatever gender to be a knight of faith in the way that, that Kierkegaard is talking about here. And he counterposes it to another key figure who's expressing in some respects what is best in human beings called the knight of infinite resignation. But the knight of faith goes beyond the knight of infinite resignation. As a matter of fact, the way that Kierkegaard arranges them in relation to each other is he says that before you can actually be the knight of faith, in some way you have to have gone through infinite resignation as a sort of stage. And this can be associated with the three stages that Kierkegaard talks about in other works, the aesthetic where one is concerned primarily with just things in the world and sort of scattered among them, not even aware of the need to uh, fundamentally prioritize among them and make important sacrifices. Then the realm of the ethical where one becomes aware of the, you might say, infinite depths of, of what it is that the spiritual or mental or whatever you want to call it realm offers to us as distinctively human. This is a, a realm of the universal where what goes for me can equally go for you and I ought to be able to communicate my insights to you. And then there's a higher realm, that of the religious. And the night of faith, as you can well surmise, is going to be moving within this realm of the religious. Kierkegaard is not using these categories very heavily here, but that's some of the underpinnings of it. And the night of infinite resignation is moving within the realm of the, the ethical. So the night of faith has, as he says, resigned everything infinitely and then grasped everything again, and this is a term that he's going to use over and over again in this section, by virtue of the absurd. By virtue of the absurd uh, means not that uh, the absurd is somehow a virtue, but through the means of the absurd or by the power that the absurd offers or the possibilities that the absurd uh, brings to bear for us, even in seeming impossibility. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So the, the night of infinite resignation and the night of faith are connected with each other in some, some very important ways. He actually says infinite resignation is the last stage before faith. So anyone who has not made this movement does not have Faith, And I think that's very useful for recognizing that Kierkegaard is talking about something quite different than many people believe, understand or believe when they talk about faith. There's a common conception that faith is sort of like knowledge or a substitute for it that would be accessible through some sort of religious revelation or object. And it's, it's just not as good as knowledge because it can't be explained. So it's a kind of credence in, in things without actually possessing genuine knowledge. But it operates as sort of a facsimile or substitute for knowledge. Kierkegaard says that's not what faith is at all. So he tells us that 
why is this important? In infinite resignation, I become conscious of my eternal validity, and only then can one speak of grasping existence by means of faith. So this gives us another conception of what this grasping things by, by the virtue of the absurd actually means. He also tells us, too, that because resignation is antecedent, because it, it precedes the movement of faith in this case, Faith, he says, is no aesthetic emotion, but something far higher. It's not the spontaneous inclination of the heart, but the paradox of existence. So that is very important. Faith is not something that you begin from. It's something that you arrive at. The knight of faith is somebody who has had to either if not being a knight of infinite resignation, at least pass through infinite resignation. And then they become able to transcend, to move to something higher. This is a good place to talk about the metaphor of the ballet dancer that Kierkegaard uses. He tells us that many people are not at this point suited for it, although this is, this is possible for anybody that they just sort of remain on the surface of life. Ballet dancers leap. They come up and they go down. And he wants to use this as a metaphor for leaping into the infinite and then coming back down and planting in a position. And he tells us that the knight of, of faith is able to do this in a way that the knight of infinite resignation is not actually able to pull off. Um, he says that the knight of, uh, here we go, most people live completely absorbed in worldly joys and sorrows. They're bench warmers who don't take part in the dance. So put them aside for the moment. The knights of infinity are ballet dancers. They have elevation. They make the upward movement and come down again. But every time that they do, they're unable to assume the posture, whatever it happens to be, Immediately, there's a little wobbling. There's an oscillation there. They don't quite fit into existence. The knight of faith, however, does. He tells us that the knight of faith comes down in such a way that there is no dissonance. There is no slight contradiction. He says that they can come down and assume the position immediately. And what is he talking about there? Uh, two of the categories that he's using are the in infinite and finitude. Finitude is the world that we experience with its limits, with its conditions. And the night of faith slips perfectly into this finite world. They are at ease in it. They are comfortable in it, even though they go beyond it at every moment, again, by virtue of the absurd. So there's this movement from the finite to the infinite to the finite once again. And he talks about the knight of faith as somebody who essentially swims within the finite and is, is A-OK -okay with it. So there are some other things that he talks about here, but I, I think I want to jump ahead to his characterization of the night of faith. He tells us, I honestly confess in my experience I have not found a single authentic instance, although I do not deny that every second person may be such an example of the night of faith. I, I travel around and I look for them, and he says, a person like this might be easily mistaken for the bourgeois Philistine. And, and now that's a term that we don't typically use these days, Philistinism. What it means is somebody who, you know, partakes in the higher culture, but doesn't appreciate the higher culture. They're the person who goes and watches the art movie and puts their feet up and gets out in the middle to go to the bathroom or get some popcorn and comes back and says, what did I miss? You know? And the night of faith could be somebody like that. They could be really anybody because you'd never actually recognize them the way you can the night of infinite resignation. He says the night of infinite resignation is easy. 
to recognize. Their walk is light and bold. There's that slight wobbling as they come back to the, the finite, showing that they're not entirely comfortable in this world that uh, doesn't entirely work for them, but that they nevertheless maintain their love, their desire, uh, both in its, in its uniqueness and, in, as Kierkegaard says, in its energy and youth. The night of faith fits in better. And so it's easy to imagine them, as he does, as some guy who you're walking along with and start a conversation with. He says, uh, Sunday is for him a holiday. He goes to church. No heavenly gaze or any sign of the incommensurable betrays him. If one did not know him, it would be impossible to distinguish him from the rest of the crowd. In the afternoon, he takes a walk to the woods. He enjoys everything he sees. The swarms of people, the new omnibus is the, the sound. Encountering him, one would take him for a mercantile soul enjoying himself. He finds pleasure in this way, for he's not a poet. And notice that the knight of faith in this case, he's describing him in a way that doesn't make him this pious, monkish soul, just you know, doing his religious duty or something like that. He enjoys the world, the created world, because he sees it in relation to God. He doesn't have to be constantly bringing up how he has faith or Jesus saved him or something along those lines. He's able to appreciate, for example, being stuck in a line or making a dish. He has a great example here of this guy walking along and telling his interlocutor about the wonderful dish that his wife has prepared for him at home. And he gets there, uh, there's no dish prepared, and it doesn't bother him at all because he is okay with existence. He is still getting what he needs out of existence by virtue of the absurd. So here's a good place to talk about some of the things that the absurd isn't that Kierkegaard wants to stress to us. He tells us that the absurd um, does not belong to the differences that lie within the proper domain of the understanding. And he, he singles out three things where we could easily get mixed up. Having faith in the absurd or having faith by virtue of the absurd is not the same thing as believing what is improbable. Like, I'm going to win the lottery. Now, it's impossible for me because I don't actually play the lottery, but if I go and buy a ticket, it is incredibly improbable that I'm going to win the lottery, but I could believe in it nonetheless. And if I happen to get the winning ticket, that's not absurd. It's just unlikely. Absurd is when it's not probable because it's not even possible. I didn't play the lottery and somehow I wound up a winner. That's something absurd. It's not the same thing as something unexpected either. You know, you go on a date with somebody who uh, was set, you were set up with and the people who set you up have, you know, these things to say about the person and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be terrible. And it turns out to be a wonderful, you know, evening. Well, that's not the absurd either, right? That's just unexpected. Or biting into a candy bar and it's, you know, the same one that you've had every lunch break. Uh, and suddenly it turns out that it's filled with whatever your favorite filling is that you couldn't get before. Well, again, unexpected, but not, not impossible. And it's not something that's unforeseen either. I mean, if you think about how much we're actually able to foresee, it's pretty limited. Unforeseen things happen to us all the time. Even things that we ought to be able to foresee if we had the time or energy to put some thought into it, they're unforeseen for us. The absurd is not that. So what is the absurd? The absurd is the impossible that does, however, get made possible. And he tells us the moment that the knight executed the act of resignation, he was convinced of the impossibility, humanly speaking. That was the conclusion of the understanding. He had sufficient energy to think it. And the night of infinite resignation lingers with that, and they're not okay with it in, in one sense, but they become okay with it in another sense. The night of faith goes further and says, it is still possible. It will turn out my way. 
God will fulfill God's promises, however paradoxical they may seem. So he goes on and he says, to the understanding, this having is no absurdity, right? Giving it up. Um, the knight of faith realizes this just as clearly. Consequently, he can be saved only by the absurd. This he grasps in faith. So he acknowledges the impossibility. And at the very same moment, he believes the absurd. For if he wants to believe he has faith without passionately acknowledging the impossibility with his whole heart and soul, he's deceiving himself. We have faith in the things that we have to have faith in because only faith would actually suffice there. If it's having faith and then the faith being fulfilled later on, that's not faith as Kierkegaard is talking about it. If it was reasonably fulfilled, if, if it was, well, I have faith in this murder mystery novel that will get to the bottom of the story and it'll be the butler and it turns out to be the butler, that's not faith in the sense that Kierkegaard talks about here. There's two other things that he wants to distinguish as well. He says that faith is a passion, but it's not the same passion as what he calls irony or humor. And Kierkegaard is definitely somebody who's very interested in both irony and humor. He wrote a, a, an entire work on irony. So he says that... Um, there's a lot of talk these days about irony and humor, especially by people who've never been able to practice or, or uh, them, but know how to explain everything. I know that these two passions are essentially different from the passion of faith. How are they different? He gives us an explanation. Irony and humor are also self-reflective and belong to the sphere of infinite resignation. Their elasticity is owing to the individual's incommensurability with actuality. So this leads us back then to this, this, this question. Well, what about the night of faith? What is so distinctive about him Why or her? Why is this so important? He tells us that, this is a little bit earlier, with the freedom from care of a reckless good-for-nothing, he lets things take care of themselves, and yet at every moment of his life, he buys the opportune time at the highest price because he does not do even the slightest thing except by virtue of the absurd. He says, he drains the deep sadness of life and infinite resignation. He knows the blessedness of infinity. He has felt the pain of renouncing everything, the most precious thing in the world. And yet, this is a key idea, the finite tastes just as good to him as to one who never knew anything higher because his remaining infinitude would have no trace of a timorous, anxious routine. And yet he has the security that makes him delight in it as if finitude was the surest thing of all. And yet the whole earthly figure he presents is a new creation by virtue of the absurd. He resigned everything infinitely and then he grasped everything again by virtue of the absurd. We come back to the passage that we began with and hopefully this gives you some conception of what Kierkegaard is talking about here with this, this character of the knight of faith. And now if we apply this to Abraham, is Abraham himself a knight of faith, or is he something beyond that, or is he perhaps the first knight of faith? That's something that you should try to ponder and think about what we know about the Abraham story and about what the absurd would be in that case. The answer is, of course, in the text, but I leave it to you to find it there.